That was such a good introduction, I feel like not saying anything more. You notice, by the way, that that professor in the Annie Hall clip uh, said he teaches at Columbia University. Well, I'm not surprised, because if you want to know about McLuhan and communications and media and their impact on our lives, uh, two far better places to teach and be a student would be Fordham University, uh, where I teach, and St. Francis College, uh, where David teaches and you are uh, students. M much better than uh, Columbia University. Um, McLuhan, I uh, love that clip, by the way, and one thing uh, that not many people know about, but McLuhan constantly mentioned this, is that Woody Allen had written some lines for McLuhan to say. Uh, but only the first part of that, you know nothing about my work, was from Woody Allen's original script. And McLuhan himself came up with the phrase, you think my fallacies are all wrong, which if you think about it doesn't make much sense. But he was delighted. McLuhan thought that was the uh, height of profundity. And uh, a lot of McLuhan's ideas border on the incomprehensible. And so one of the ways that I've had fun over the years is trying to uh, tweeze a little bit of meaning uh, out of some of McLuhan's work. Uh, McLuhan and I actually met in the late 1970s. I had sent up a copy of my doctoral dissertation. And uh, when you do a doctoral dissertation, you know, you work on it and, you know, then you begin showing it to people. So one day, I come home and there's a message on my answering machine. And I press the button. In those days, it was like an old cumbersome machine. I hear this like staticky message. And I couldn't believe my ears. It's Marshall McLuhan's voice. And he says, oh, hello, Paul. Uh, you know, uh, good to be talking to you. Uh, you know, I, I read the dissertation. You got my uh, theory of media determinism 100% wrong. Uh, but <laughs> You know, just the kind of encouragement I needed for my uh, upcoming doctoral orals. But he, he was by far the most exciting uh, human being that I've ever known in an intellectual sense. One of the times that Tina and I went up to Toronto to visit him, we go back to our hotel, uh, the Chelsea Hotel in downtown Toronto, and it's about 11.30 in the evening, which is actually pretty early uh, for Tina and me. But I'd assume that McLuhan was sound asleep. Uh, the phone rings. I pick up the phone, and here's Marshall saying, oh, Paul, you must turn on the television. So I turn it on, and there is Richard Nixon being interviewed by David Frost. Have any of you seen the Frost? So this actually was uh, the real thing, not the movie. And, and here is McLuhan, who has been watching this. And for the next 10 minutes, he handicaps comments on everything in the interview. Oh, you know, Frost made a good point. Well, uh, you know, Nixon's getting you know, somewhat better. He, he's not as hot as he once was. By the way, hot was not good in McLuhan's parlance. Uh, not that he didn't mind being hot in the way that we think hot is good. But for McLuhan, hot was too much overbearing. And it was better to be cool relaxed, lay back. And actually, McLuhan had said that in the 1960 presidential election, Nixon lost because he was too hot for the television medium. How many of you have ever seen the Kennedy-Nixon debates? It's an interesting study in how not so much what people say, that's the content, but the way in which they say it uh, can be decisive in who you think is making the better point. And if you look at those debates, they talk about issues like Kimoy and Matsu, these little islands off the coast of China, economic issues. And Nixon actually makes some very good points. But the problem for Nixon is anytime the camera went to him for a reaction shot, when Kennedy was talking, Nixon was doing things like, you know, um, and in contrast, when the camera went to JFK, he was, you know, relaxed, taking notes. In other words, JFK was cool and relaxed. Nixon was overbearing. And an interesting 
point that McLuhan was the first to notice, and it's now become a sort of uh, fundamental principle of understanding the impact of media, is that a majority of people who heard the debate on the radio thought that Nixon had won and had done much better. But a majority of people who saw the exact same debate, the exact same words, thought that Kennedy did better. Now, it was a very close election, and uh, I'm happy that Kennedy won. Uh, possibly he actually didn't win. Uh, mayor Daley was then mayor of Chicago. Not the recent Mayor Daley. This was the recent Mayor Daley's father. Um, and the old joke about Chicago politics, which uh, is still true to some extent, is have you heard about this new reform they put in in Chicago? They now only count the vote of dead people once, because more than <laughs> once you know, wouldn't be uh, right. And so some people think that Kennedy might have actually lost the state of Illinois. But it was a very close election. And there's no doubt that had it not been for the television performance, that Kennedy probably would not have done that well. So one of the phrases that people often talk about when they're trying to understand McLuhan's work, and tell me how many of you have heard of this phrase, the medium is the message. Any of you hear this? Well, uh, how about a student tell me, what does that phrase mean to you, the medium is the message? Yeah, you're a student rather than a professor? OK, what do you think that means? Okay, that's actually pretty good. And really what McLuhan is talking about along those lines is it's the medium, it's the way of communicating. In contrast to the content or what is communicated, what is said, that often has the most profound impact when we interact with media. So if you think about that Kennedy-Nixon situation, and Nixon you know, it doesn't, it, it, he didn't even say anything. He was just like sort of, you know, looking like, would you buy a used car from this guy? I don't think so. And, you know, Kennedy looking calm, that was the medium of television. Uh, and McLuhan made all kinds of interesting claims about this. Uh, for example, at one point he said, there wouldn't have been an Adolf Hitler had there been television rather than radio in Germany in the 1930s. I remember when I first heard that, it seems like a wild, off-the-cuff statement. But if you think about it, Hitler didn't look anything like the Aryan ideal that he was preaching, you know, this wonderful super race. In fact, he looked like a lunatic, but he had a very powerful voice. And so it was his good fortune and the world's bad fortune that he came to power at a time that radio was in the ascendancy. So Hitler could address the German people, and they would hear this voice, <laughs> whatever it is he was saying, in German, and you don't even have to understand the words. It was a very emotional, powerful presentation, and that worked for Hitler. As a matter of fact, an interesting little bit of history, and this is something else about McLuhan, which uh, proves to be continually relevant. Uh, he, he says something like the medium is the message, and you try to understand it, and then sooner or later you come across some fact in history or some fact in the current world. And by the way, before I finish talking to you today, I'm going to tell you how McLuhan might have looked at what's going on in the Middle East uh, right now. But after I had come across McLuhan's the medium is the message and understood it, vis-a-vis -vis Kennedy, Nixon, many other examples, I came upon this very interesting uh, historical fact. Any of you see the movie Valkyrie starring Tom Cruise? Was that a couple of years ago? Yeah, it was a pretty good movie. It's about, um, it, it, actually, it's a fascinating you know, point in history th that a, a part of the German military r had come to realize that Hitler was going to lead the country into destruction. The Allies had already turned the tide of the war. And so what they planned on doing is 
killing Hitler, assassinating Hitler. And they put together this very complex uh, bomb plot. And it, you know, it worked pretty well, but unfortunately not completely. Hitler was seated at a table. The bomb went off. Unfortunately, the bomb had been slightly moved, so it wasn't that close to Hitler. And to make matters worse, the table was like a steel table. The people who were planning this didn't realize that it was going to be a steel table, so it absorbed a lot of the shock of the bomb. Bottom line, Hitler was hurt, uh, not that seriously, and certainly not killed. So flash forward to later that evening, and the next day there were rumors flying across Germany. It's really hanging in the balance. If the conspirators can convince enough of the German military that Hitler is dead, then the German military will go against the Nazis. But Joseph Goebbels, who is Hitler's minister of propaganda and popular enlightenment, by the way, whatever else you say about the Nazis, you've got to admire that title. At least it's an honest title. He's the minister of propaganda. Now, you know, here, like in you know, the United States, it's like you know, press secretary. No, come on. You know. <laughs> propaganda. And uh, very bright guy. He had a PhD, by the way, which shows you that not only nice people have PhDs, this guy got a PhD from the University of Heidelberg in 1922. Very bright guy. And what he does is he goes up to Hitler's hospital room and he has a microphone, you know, much like right here. And he, he says, mein Führer, you know, you have to talk to the German people. And Hitler does just that. And that convinces the military who are hanging in the balance that, look, you know, the Führer is fine. And so the plot there, there at that moment crumbles. So radio was a decisive friend of Hitler. Um, and, and not only Hitler, it was, it, it was a friend of anybody in power. Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, and his fireside chats were able to captivate and inspire the United States during the Great Depression. Which, by the way, was much worse than what we're going through now. You know, people who compare this uh, to back then, uh, I mean, this is not good, what we now have, but to give you an idea, there was unemployment as high as 30% in many parts of the country in the 1930s. Now we have 9%. That's not good, but it's, you know, it's nowhere nearly as bad as that. One of the things that kept the country together is Roosevelt's addresses to the nation. And again, a fact that some people didn't know back then is that Roosevelt had suffered a, a debilitating bout of polio when he was much younger, and he was in a wheelchair. But he was able to project a sense of power and confidence, in part because when he addressed the nation, people didn't see him sitting in a wheelchair. And by the way, back then, people were a lot more prejudiced against anyone with handicaps than they are now. I, I don't know if it would be such an impediment now, but in the 1930s, it was. So radio was Roosevelt's friend. Radio was also Joseph Stalin's friend when the Germans attacked uh, the Soviet Union, and they were just rolling across uh, at blitzkrieg speed. That means very fast. It got to the point where Stalin was concerned that this might be the end of the Soviet Union, and he got on the radio and he urged his countrymen to do a very unusual thing, to basically burn their crops, kill their livestock, and then flee uh, away from the German invaders. Now, why would Stalin have wanted people to burn their own livestock and their own crops? Because that way, when the Germans would get there, they would have no food and no supplies. And eventually, the German supply lines uh, were stretched uh, too thin to be effective, and their blitzkrieg came to a halt. Again, radio was able to do that. And Stalin was not even a very good speaker. So I could give you other examples, like Winston Churchill, how he inspired the British people. Uh, but all of those are examples of the medium being the message. It was not so much what these people said. It was their ability to use the medium. Now, the first time that Marshall McLuhan made any statement of that was actually in a book that not that many people know about. Uh, it was his first uh, published book. It was called The Mechanical Bride. It goes back to 1951. And McLuhan, born in 1911, was 40 years old. 
So he was no youngster when he wrote his first book. And McLuhan later <clears throat> said that he thought a lot of that book was not all that good. Um, authors sometimes feel that way about their first works, but I'm too arrogant and egotistical, so I, I think my first book is great too. So, but um, McLuhan uh, wasn't that thrilled with that book. But there was one page in that book which gave an inkling of what McLuhan would go on to do. And uh, it was a page that talked about the New York Times. You all know about the New York Times. Well, McLuhan made this a very interesting observation. He said, you know, you can look at the front page of any copy of the New York Times, not read a thing, but just know by looking at the page what kind of a news day, not the day obviously because newspapers are printed up the day after news happens, but what kind of day in world events it was yesterday. And what did he mean by that? Well, if you have banner headlines, I guess like the last banner headline in the Times was maybe when Mubarak left. So I mean, you, you can see, just you don't have to even read it, you know that something important happened. There was a banner headline when Obama was elected president. You know, they're, they're actually a little more frequent now than they used to be. But the point is, that's the medium being the message. The medium of the front page of the newspaper gives you a message about the importance of events, even if you are totally illiterate. You don't have to read that material. Now, McLuhan went on to write some very uh, important uh, books. And uh, all of his books are worth uh, reading. The two books that receive the most amount of attention, uh, probably, however, are The Gutenberg Galaxy, published in 1962, and Understanding Media in 1964. Understanding Media is where the expression, the medium, is the message comes from. Back in 1962, though, in The Gutenberg Galaxy, McLuhan made another very, very important observation which is very relevant, even predictive, of where we are today. He said back then that electronic media are recreating the world into a global village. How many of you have heard the phrase global village? So that's, you know, disseminated pretty far and wide. But if you look at that more carefully, it's very interesting. 1962, electronic media are making the world into a global village. Is that really the way the world was in 1962? Well, first let's look at what McLuhan was trying to get at by global village. By village, he meant that unlike a situation in which there's just one person talking and everybody else listening, does that sound familiar? That's what I'm doing right now, right? But uh, when I call upon you and you answer questions and you'll be able to ask me questions after I'm finished with this, uh, that's much more like a village because although you have people speaking in the village, other people can ask questions. There's interaction among everyone. And the word global, well, that's pretty obvious. It means earth size around the earth, the whole earth functioning as a village. In the year 1962, was there any global television? Not really. It is the case, and this is what got McLuhan thinking about that, that the Telstar satellite had recently been launched, and that was in fact the first telecom satellite. Uh, this kind of communication had been written about back in 1945 by the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, and it wasn't until the early 60s that it actually was realized. But it didn't really carry any television. And in fact, the most you had in 1962, as far as this global image is concerned, was a national village. So it was true that when everybody was looking at the Kennedy-Nixon debates, say in 1960, you had a national community. Not international. The people in China were not looking at the Kennedy-Nixon debates. They didn't even have any televisions there. 
you know, maybe a couple of people in England were watching it, uh, but, pro but, on, but not live, you know, on, on some kind of relay. I mean, just for a second on that, uh, during the Vietnam War in the late 1960s, the video images that we in America saw of what was going on in Vietnam, even then they weren't live. They were basically video recorded in Vietnam, and the videotapes were shipped as fast as they could be back to the United States, and therein put into the news. So it was not at all live, even by the late 60s. So what, what was McLuhan getting at when he said, electronic media are turning the world into a global village? Well, as I point out at length in one of my books, Digital McLuhan, what he was getting at was not description, but something that's much more valuable, really, prediction. Because all the things that I just mentioned that were not the case in 1962, and by the way, we can add to that, even television on a national level was not village-like, because let's say you had uh, 40 million Americans watching something on television at the same time. All they could do were watch. They couldn't communicate with each other. I mean, you might be able to communicate to someone who's standing or sitting right next to you. You might call somebody up on the phone. But basically, there was not much, if any, communication among the people in the audience. That's not a village, unless we're talking about a village of wires. Actually, that could be the title of a good new movie. And now, coming from Paramount, Village of Wires. Sort of a sequel to The Walking Dead or something. So, this was not a village in 1962, and it was not global. But let's look at the world uh, today, before we get back to more of what McLuhan uh, said and wrote, in the year 2011. And I said I was going to be talking about the Middle East. And if you've been following what's been going on there, what has happened is, you know, periodically, when people live in societies where they don't have much freedom, where there aren't the democratic processes that we have here and sometimes take for granted, but periodically in other places, people get fed up with that kind of life. And what they do is uh, they start protesting. That happens a lot. And sometimes it succeeds. Most of the time it does not succeed. As a matter of fact, in the year 2009, and this was literally right around the time I was handing in my final corrections to the page proofs, of my book, New New Media. And in publishing, what that means is that I had finished writing the book, the copy editors had gone over it, it had already been set into pages, and all I was supposed to do is just look through it one more time and make sure uh, there weren't any mistakes, which, by the way, there's always a mistake. Or, no matter how, there's like a law of entropy. No matter how many times you try to correct something and get it perfect in a book, some fool in the publishing house is going to still make some mistake. So uh, if any of you have a copy of New New Media, email me when you discover a mistake, a stupid mistake, which of course I didn't make because I never make any mistakes. Uh, anyway, so this is the stage that the book was in. And it's, uh, it's June 2009, going into July. And I say to the editor, look, you know, there's a revolution brewing right now in Iran. And uh, there's nothing in this book about that. And how can I have a book that talks about Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and not mention this? And she said, look, but, you know, the, you know, the time for doing that is, has gone. You can put that in the next edition of the book. You know, you just can't keep the book open and keep adding stuff. And I said, okay, but the time isn't gone. The book hasn't been published. Let me send you a couple of paragraphs. So I did. And they did get into the book. So that was good news for me. But however, uh, there wasn't good news for the people in Iran at that point. Because although they had Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, 
uh, it was not strong enough to bring out an overwhelming force in terms of number of people and the weight of ideas and the cry for freedom that was needed to topple the government there. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It didn't work in China, in Tiananmen Square. And you've probably all seen that famous image of like the, the, the student, the guy standing up you know, against the tank. And you know, the tank doesn't roll over him and kill him, but that's in effect what the uh, Chinese tanks did to the people who were protesting there. But these elements have grown in just two years. And what McLuhan was getting at when he said, the world is turning into a global village, now finally has happened. And when those protesters are out there, some of you may have even heard this, that uh, someone named their baby Facebook. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit of a strange uh, name. I would have probably gone for like Google, because then you say like goo goo or something like that. Uh, I, I can't quite see how you can be like a fraction. Oh, ooh, cute little Facebook. You're so adorable. Dad. That doesn't quite you know, work. But, uh, you know, it shows the importance that the Egyptian people uh, put uh, correctly on these media. Because without Twitter, without Facebook, without YouTube, each of which did somewhat different things, there's a very good chance that Mubarak might have endured. It's tough to overthrow someone, but it becomes easier when that attempt to change the government is tied into a global village that's watching and communicating back and forth. So McLuhan, in 1962, electronic media are recreating the world into a global village. It was a prediction, uh, m not really a description, and it was a prediction uh, that in effect, guided the world. And remember I said earlier about sometimes you come across an idea, it could be a McLuhan or anyone, but McLuhan in particular, where you understand the idea on its own terms, but that's only later that you come across either an event in history or an event that is happening right now, and it fits into what uh, you were trying to understand of the concept. So if we go back to the medium is the message, it didn't matter what specifically was being tweeted. It didn't matter what specifically was being posted on Facebook pages. Or w the videos on YouTube mattered a little more because it was important for people around the world to see with their own eyes what was going on in Egypt. But what mattered the most in all those cases was that information was getting out. And the medium in that situation, in all those cases, was the message. Now, one of the things that McLuhan said, and you know, one of the reasons I find McLuhan a sort of endless uh, source of knowledge and inspiration, uh, as much now as when I first met him and knew him, a uh, hundred years after his uh, birth, is that not only his well-known phrases, but sometimes his little-known phrases can turn out to have uh, a lot of important meaning as well. How many of you have ever heard this uh, phrase from McLuhan? The Xerox machine is making every author into a publisher. Okay, David heard it because I drilled it into his head in the new school. Good. Where did you hear that phrase? But you heard it. All right, very good. Maybe you read one of McLuhan's books. Um, or maybe one of my books. But, you know, at the time I heard that, first of all, I understood it immediately because, you know, back then uh, I was not a published author. But I realized what McLuhan was saying, that, you know, it's an interesting point. You can, you know, type something up. This is like, you know, the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, you could Xerox X number of copies and send them out. And in a way, that's a primitive form of publishing. 
by the way, back to Nazi Germany, there was a group called the White Rose, which in the teeth of the Nazi regime were able for a few years to print up pamphlets criticizing what the Nazis did. And the Nazis, it took them about three years to finally hunt these people down. And that's because all they had was a little Xerox machine that they kept in a back room someplace, and they were able to move it. So it's a very powerful publishing instrument. But as powerful as the Xerox machine was, let's compare that to, well, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, blogging. How many of you have Twitter accounts, by the way? Okay. How many of you have Facebook pages? All right. How many of you I am every once in a while? By the way, how many of you, just as a matter of interest, I am on your cell phones more than you talk on your cell phones? Yeah, yeah, right. So, okay. Wouldn't it be good if I could speak English? Okay. Right. So, you te so almost all of you text more than you talk. Um, what about you, David? Do you talk or text more? Old You're old-fashioned. Well, it's true. People our age, uh, and David's about 10 years older than I am somehow. <laughs> <laughs> he taught me everything I know. But uh, people our age, uh, you know, do tend to talk more than uh, text. Actually, I mean, I can see the advantages of texting. Uh, n nobody can hear your tone of voice. You know, you ever have, like, the experience, like, where somebody calls you, and you don't want the person to know, like, how happy you are to hear from them, or maybe you're upset, or, like, maybe you ever have the experience, like, you're talking to, like, a parent or something, and they, you know, and you're not, you're not in a very good mood. My mother used to do this to me all the time. My wife still does. It drives me crazy. Is everything okay? Uh, no, it's just my tone of voice. Every once in a while, I get, like, into an irritable tone of voice. But texting, you know, removes all that. So there again, the medium is the message. But in all those things, texting, I having, tweeting, who else my age can just rattle these things off? Facebook pages, YouTube videos. They have two things in common. Two profound things in common. Um, one of which flows directly from what McLuhan said about the Xerox machine. So the first and most important is they turn all consumers into producers. Now, if that doesn't seem like an unusual or amazing thing to you, think about that the next time you're watching something on television, the next time you are listening to something on the radio, the next time you're reading a book, reading a newspaper. In all of those media, those older media, the information is going from some central system to you, and all you can do is you can absorb it or you can put it away. You can't put your ideas into that process. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, what about letters to the editor? Uh, okay, try writing a letter to the New York Times and see how many times they publish it. Uh, I've had, I think, maybe three letters uh, published. Um, I don't even write letters to them anymore because uh, I got really annoyed a few years ago, apropos McLuhan, uh, there was a uh, biography of McLuhan, which uh, someone uh, by the name of Philip Marchand wrote, very good uh, biography. And for some reason, I'll never know why, the New York Times chose someone, his name is Mark Edmondson, uh, who was a professor of English from someplace in North Carolina. So I don't care that he's from North Carolina. I'm just throwing that in for a little flavor. But what I do care about is why they ask a professor of English to review a book about McLuhan. I mean, am I missing something? They could have asked Professor Jewitz right here and maybe pronounced his name correctly, too. So, you know... And, okay, I admit that I was a little uh, miffed. They didn't ask me. They didn't ask anybody that I knew as a McLuhan scholar. And on top of that, it was an idiotic review. The person, you know, didn't understand McLuhan. That's why, again, I, he probably was educated at Columbia University. It was like that guy, you know, in that, in that clip, right? Hey, why can't I have an opinion? You know, television is hot. No, it's not. That's not what McLuhan said. 
We'll talk about that in half a second. But um, the fact of the matter is, um, I wrote a letter to the New York Times. I know about a dozen people who wrote letters to the New York Times review section saying, by the way, we didn't say, I didn't say, hey, how come you didn't ask me to review this book? But I did say, hey, here are some errors, just factual errors, outright factual errors in this North Carolina professor's review from an English department of uh, McLuhan's biography. None of the labs were published. That was an era before blogging, before YouTube, before Facebook, before Twitter. Now, if you see something that bothers you, you don't have to write a letter to the editor and hope that they deign to publish it. You can publish it yourself. Here's a recent example. How many of you saw the Grammys about a week or two ago? How many of you noticed how many times uh, they were bleeped, right? Eminem was you know, doing something, wasn't Slim Shady, whatever it was he was singing, and they bleeped him a couple of times. They bleeped Lady Gaga during her acceptance speech. Um, they didn't bleep Justin Bieber because everything he says is so childish, why bleep him? No, that's not true. <laughs> I had lunch last week with Neil Postman, another important media theorist, with his wife, Shelly, and she confessed to me that she likes Justin Bieber. Baby, baby, oh, is that sweet? It's like a 75-year-old woman, so more power to her. Anyhow, <laughs> But here's the point, I mean, it really bothers me anytime I hear anything bleeped on, on television. It bothers me for, for a whole bunch of reasons. And, you know, here are some of them. One is, the last time I checked, we have a First Amendment in this country, which says Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or press. That's what it says. Yet the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, fines stations millions of dollars when they broadcast words and images that the FCC thinks somehow are objectionable. Fox was fined millions of dollars because in Family Guy there was a shot of a baby's backside, a cartoon. So cartoon baby butt on Family Guy, five, five million dollars, wow. Um, and all kinds of other stuff like that. So it's a form of censorship, uh, and, but I don't like it for artistic reasons. I mean, you know, excuse me, I'm like a peculiar guy. I like to hear a song the way the artist wanted to perform it, not the way CBS wanted to censor it because they were frightened of FCC fines. So I wrote a blog post about it. And it got picked up, and I actually wrote about this last year. And it, here's a, a way in which what I'm talking about works. Uh, last year, CBS did the same thing. In fact, Eminem was bleeped last year, too, at the Grammys. He has the honor of being bleeped two years in a row. Um, last year, the Los Angeles Times wrote an article about the bleeping and quoted my blog with a link to it. What's the point here? Now, it is true that I'm an author, right? I have books out and stuff, but that's not what the blog was about. Anybody could have written that blog. You could have written that blog. The guy selling hot dogs down on the street, he could have written that post. And had it been clear enough and vivid enough and provocative enough, I didn't call the Los Angeles Times up and say, hey, I wrote this blog post. They just did a search. They were trying to see who else was writing about the Grammys being bleeped. And they came upon my post. The consumer has become a publisher. And what McLuhan was talking about way back then, about the Xerox machine, his brilliant recognition, because if you think about it, okay, say whenever McLuhan wrote this sometime in the late 60s, there were publishers that printed things up, but what the Xerox machine allowed is anybody to become uh, a publisher. Now you can spend a lifetime talking about McLuhan. Uh, and it, 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 as far as I am concerned, it never it gets old. 
Uh, and that's because when you talk about the media, you're talking about a work in progress. Media are not static. They evolve, just like living organisms evolve. And one of the things I realized uh, back in the 70s when I was doing my doctoral dissertation is that in the real world, in the world of natural selections, organisms compete with one another and sometimes they kill one another off. Someone once said evolution is red in tooth and claw. All right, I'll try to make it more interesting next time. No, I know, so if, you, if you have to leave, if you have classes, it's all right. Um, but um, in the world of media, it's also constantly evolving, but they don't kill each other off. We decide what media survive and what media uh, don't survive. And that's an enormous amount of power. If you think about it, how many of you have seen the movie The Social Contract? Uh, that movie, you know, is about someone who started with, you know, little or nothing, and maybe or maybe not the idea was completely uh, Zuckerberg's. But the point is he now is a multi-billionaire because we selected uh, this medium, Facebook. We decided that Facebook was better than MySpace. We decided that we would rather read about each other on Facebook than on Friendster. In other words, there was more than one site at the time. So let me just uh, finish up here uh, by, by saying two things. One, this hot and cool thing. Why did McLuhan say that uh, television was cool? It's because it didn't overwhelm us with information. It encouraged us to put ourselves out to understand what it was presenting to us. Uh, in contrast, a hot medium bombards us and floods us with information. And if you look at what I've been talking about today, on the one hand, there is a lot of information out there, but on the other hand, it is not something that's imposed upon you. And this brings me to my final point. It's something that's out there for you to use, uh, for you to make your own revolutions. Uh, and if you do that, you'll make McLuhan happy, you'll make me happy, and even Professor Gewirtz happy. Thank you very much. <laughs>